with all seven hairs on his head. No. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> all right. We're going to be in Second Samuel chapter seven. Second Samuel chapter seven. We get and I did that little intro. It wasn't an intro. I just wanted to say that because. I think you guys should know who Kurt is. And I'll, I will tell you this. He's got one of the purest hearts concerning worship that I know. And, you know, he told me what his desire ultimately is. And it's I love it. He said, assuming he still stands, that he wants to raise up the next generation of worship leaders. You know, and, and I'm going to tell you what my favorite thing about the way he does worship. As, as long as I've known him, it's nothing's changed as it's not a show. You know, I've been to the big churches. I've worked in some of the big churches and... One of the things I've never liked is the show. The shows are hard for me to worship. You know, and I, I love Calvary. If you're online, you know, don't get your underwear in a bunch, you know. But when I worked at Calvary, and I mean, I love the teaching. Skip is still one of my favorite teachers. He is. I love Skip's teachings. I love the way he teaches. It's just, it's for me. But when the worship would happen, the teams were so good. And I just, I could never worship with my eyes open because I would be so distracted. I'd have to just tune everything out and I'd have to just try to pay attention to the words. And even then, sometimes it was just a little much for my soul and I'd be like, Lord, this is... And I'll tell you where it really got to me. They had this gentleman come from Macedonia and uh, I guess he, they'd been working with Macedonia for like 20 years and he's known this guy for like 20 years and mind you, 20 years ago, Calvary was much different than it is today. And I remember sitting there, I was like, this is cool, like the Macedonian man. This is like the guy that Paul saw in his vision. During worship, I was watching him, and I saw the heaviness of his heart. And it wasn't a good thing. He, he was looking like, what is this? Like, what are they doing? Why are they doing this? And I remember seeing that, and my soul sank in me. I was like, ah, I understand what he's coming from. So could I really encourage you, man, like raise that next generation up. And, you know, and it's like you always say, worship in spirit and in truth. You know, the show, you want a show? Wait till we get to heaven. Oh, God's got a show. Because the beautiful thing is he's going to be the star of that show. When we make the show here, we become the stars and we take the attention away from him. You know, and I love the simplicity in worship and I pray that our team never changes. Of course, it's going to change because you ain't going to be here forever. But I pray that same attitude, that same spirit comes with every worship personnel that comes to this team. That, you know, that they truly just want to worship the Lord in simplicity. But... Now we get to the text. Let's pray first. Father, we thank you for being our God. We lift your name high, Lord, and we bless you. We honor you. We glorify you. We praise your holy name, Lord. And we just, ah, we open our hearts and our hands to you and ask that you would place in us and in our hands what it is that you have for us, that you would get our minds off of ourselves, get our minds away from the distractions of life, of our jobs, of our spouses, of our kids, Father, of anything that's keeping us from centering our attention on you. And we ask, Lord, that you would be our teacher this evening. Father, I ask that you'd get me out of my way and get me out of your way dad just do your thing move mightily through me speak father i, I just want to be an open vessel and i pray that you'd open our hearts and our minds that you take out the things that don't belong and fill us with you who belongs let these words not just be words lord but let them be transformative in our lives and the way we act think talk and live lord pray that your word would be the strength for each day that we get up and go forward. We want you above the blessings, Lord. And we ask that as we get into your word this evening, that you would do exactly that. We just love you, Dad, and we bless your holy name in Jesus' name we pray. My middle son, Riley, you guys know him. He's probably one of the sweetest kids in the world. He really is. You know, if you were to back up about 10 years, he was a monster. Oh, I really thought he was possessed. You could ask my wife. One one night, you know, he was just like going crazy, screaming like for like six hours. Just Burr. and I looked at her. I was holding him because he was squirming, screaming like it was like nuts. And I looked at her. I said, "I think he's possessed." Yeah. And my wife stopped. She said, "You th you think?" Like she genuinely. And I was I was being serious. And as he's grown up, he's just become the sweetest kid. Like really, I, I genuinely mean that. He's just kind. He's He's generous. He's loving. He will give you the shirt off his back. He will stop what he's doing to help if you ask him. He's just a sweet kid. And sometimes in his sweetness, he does things thinking he's helping and he's hurting. My mom has been staying in our home and we have the, I have this wicked awesome blow-up mattress. Now when I talk to people about, is it, is it 
Is it really? I talk to people about this mattress and how comfortable it is, and I always get the same look like it's a blow-up mattress. No, you don't understand. It's nice. And, you know, when she started staying at my house, she thought, I'm going to hate this mattress. No, it's, it's bomb. It's, the be it's better than your beds. I'll, I'll, I'll be willing to put money on it. It is like the most comfortable, stupid mattress in the world. But it's still a blow-up mattress. So that leaves room for punctures. Well, my mom brought her little dog and we found a little dog, and they're both little puppies, about the same age, what, three months or something, four months. And I didn't want the blow-up mattress deflated unless I did it so that I could put it away immediately. Otherwise, the dogs already knew, like, they're going to look at it as a chew toy. Well, you know, I told the boys, do not deflate this mattress. Why? Because I said, Just don't. Do not do it, please. Okay, so the next day Riley comes downstairs and I, I think I was busy cutting hair and I come in and the mattress is deflated on the floor. I said, who did that? I looked at my mom, did you, did you do that? She goes, no. I looked at Riley, did you do that? He goes, yeah. Why? I was like, no. So I, you know, turn it on, get, get it filled up and pss, the dogs run amok on it. It has holes everywhere. And it was really hard because I was really upset. And my main upset was I asked you not to. And I get his mind was, well, if I, if I deflate it for you, I save you like five or ten minutes. And that was his attitude. And so I was holding in my frustration because I know in his heart he wanted to do right. But in his attempt to help me, he hurt me because then I had to buy another one, which it's still good, but it's not quite the same. That one had, had a bunch of issues. So I had to buy another one. And we'll see how that one holds up. We, we actually got a bed now. But, you know, this weird bed that like folds into a cabinet. But my point in what I'm saying is, what? Is it, is it doing it? Okay, hold on. Let me see here. Yeah, I did. All right, let's see. That should do it. If not, sorry, man. He's saying that my... Uh... All right, that should do it. That is legitimately as close as I can get to this thing. Lord willing, it doesn't jump off. Um, the reason that I'm saying that is because today we are going to see David attempt to do something for God out of the generosity and the goodness of his heart. But he's going to do something that God didn't ask him to do. He's going to attempt to do it. And we're going to see that God is going to put him on a crass course correction and says, David, no, this isn't for you. And David's going to listen because David's wise. And I say that so that we would understand going forward. Sometimes your intentions are really good in your service to the Lord. Your intentions are for the building of His kingdom. Your intentions are for the glory of His name. Your intentions are for His honor. But when we find ourselves doing things God has not asked us to do, we find ourselves in a dangerous place of doing things out of line with what God wants. You're going to see what I mean today. I know that sounds a little odd. Think of my son. Sometimes we think we're helping, but we're not. And we're going to find the greatest way to know you're in the will of God is to seek Him first. The more I seek you, the more I find you. The more I find you, the more I love you. Sit at His feet, drink from the cup in His hand, lay against Him and breathe. Hear His heart beat. It's like this morning, if you guys were here, if you're not, you don't get it, but those of you that were, get it. It's that same attitude as Mary. Just come to the Lord's feet. Or even Lazarus. Fellowship with the Lord. Or you can be like Mary. Your service to God. All these things draw us nearer to us, to Him. They should anyway. Nearer to us. But in chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Now it came about when King David lived in his house, and Yahweh had given him rest on every side from all his enemies. That the king said to Nathan the prophet. And I'm going to stop there because I want to look at verse 1 first. So we're going to see David's desire to do right. But it says, David was flourishing and doing well. It says, it came about when he lived in his house and Yahweh gave him rest on every side. Now we've been through 1 Samuel and now we've continued in 2 Samuel. When and where did David build his house? And what is this rest that the Bible is talking about? It kind of like pops out of nowhere, right? It pops onto the pages like, ta-da. David's established, he's got a home, it's foundations, he's got rest, favor with God. Where did all this happen? It seems like everything is going at such a rapid pace. 
Now, you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to just take a quick couple pages to the left to chapter 5. And if we look at verse 11, it says, Then Hiram, the king of Tyre, sent messengers to David with cedar trees and carpenters and stonemasons, and they built a house for David. Now, when we look at that one verse, there's a lot going on in that little verse. As a matter of fact, that little verse probably covers several years worth of time. And those years just pass right on by. And then again in verse 1 it says, God gave him rest on every side. Well, when did that happen? Again, chapter 5's got the answers. Chapter 5, verse 17 through 25. I'm not going to read them. But essentially, David goes to war with the Philistines. They were the biggest issue in the land. The Philistines really were the big dogs that were the real splinter in the side of Israel. And when David assumed the throne... That issue was dealt with. And under the reign of David, by and far, there was rest from the surrounding nations that were Israel's issues. And we see that rest continues forward in Solomon's day. And actually, it's even amplified, and the kingdom is even spread further under the reign of Solomon. And it's not until we get to the reign of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, that everything goes down the crapper. Because, well, we'll get there. But David has been given rest. So from chapter 5, and then we get into chapter 6, and remember, all this is going on, and David says, we got to bring the ark home. And I'm not going to get into all the details of that, because it's just, we did that last week. But David goes, and they bring the ark, and they have their issues, and they have to pull over and drop the ark off at Obed-Edom's house. And some months pass, almost a whole year, and then they go back and get the ark and fully bring it home. And they come into the city celebrating. And now we're in chapter 7, and... David's built a house. David has rest. And for us reading, it's just two little chapters, less than a hundred verses. But yet in the life of the scriptures, years have passed. And I say that because for us, it's important to remember that in the scriptures, there are large time gaps throughout. When we look at chapters, when we look at verses, again, chapter 5, verse 11 in that little verse, from verse five to verse or verse eleven to verse twelve, months, if not years, have passed. Because mind you, when they built a house back then, it wasn't like they do today. It was a much more complex system. And mind you, David built what would be a mansion considered in that day a palace. Time has passed, and for us, we read the scriptures, and sometimes I get a sense of discouragement reading the scriptures. You know, you you know, you look at the life of. Paul, you look at the life of the apostles, the disciples, you look at the life of the people of the Bible and the prophets, and it's like from glory to 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 glory. And then here we are, and God used us like six months to go at the gas station. And you know, I, I've been waiting to be used ever since. And then finally, six months later, yeah, God showed me something in His Word. And then four more months pass, and and it, it can be discouraging because it feels like maybe we're living the Christian life wrong because we read the Bible and it's like from mountaintop to mountaintop. And when we read the scriptures, we're not, we don't realize that there's often massive time gaps sometimes between verses, between chapters, even between books, tip for sure between books. And it's important for us to remember that, that when these things are chronicled, they're chronicling the highlights primarily of the things happened. Because if they were to chronicle every little detail, it would look much like our lives. I'd imagine there are times where David didn't hear anything from God. Hence, we hear the Psalms sometimes, and they're dark. And they're ominous, and they're depressing. And David feels left and abandoned. Because there were times where David felt discouraged. And so I want us to keep that in the forefront of our minds, that there are massive time gaps, and that you keep being faithful to the Lord. And you might have a mountaintop experience often, like once a month. Sometimes a couple times a month. Sometimes it doesn't happen for six months. That should not change your faithfulness and your servitude and your worship to the Lord. We don't worship God for the mountaintop experience. We worship the Lord for He is God and worthy of that worship. And with that worship comes times of peace and mountaintop experiences. And we revel in those and we keep those in the back of our minds as Ebenezer stones. You guys remember what those are? Stones of remembrance. And we look at those times when God was magnified and we say, 
I might be in a valley, but I know one of those is coming here in the near, near future. And we keep our eyes on the Lord, and not on the blessing. <laughs> but David, since chapter 5 and 6, he's had a house built. He's been given rest on all sides from his enemies. And in verse 2, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in the house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells with intent curtains. He looks at his life. He says, my beautiful house. I got all this rest. I got all this favor from God. I got all this wealth now. And God's over there in a tent. What do I do about this? Now, what David really wants to do is he wants to give God a permanent residence. And partially because that is one of the things God is desiring because God is looking for a place for his name to dwell. And that is eventually going to be Jerusalem. However, where David has made the mistake, is he's assumed the will of God without consulting God for his will. And that's where we often make the mistake. What David is going to desire, what he did desire in this passage, is a good desire. But that desire wasn't David's to fill out. And that's why I say sometimes we think we're, we're helping God and we're not. I'll give you a great example. Sometimes we help people thinking we're doing them good, but we're truly holding them down. Sometimes people need to be let go so they can fly. And if you never take your thumb off of them, they'll never lift up and soar. And our fear in taking our thumb off of them is, well, what if they fall? That's their fault to work out with God. And if they don't fall, they'll never learn to spread their wings and fly because they become dependent on us. And they need to learn to become dependent on the Lord. And again, I've done this. You know, I've had several people in my family that were addicted to drugs and alcohol. And, you know, you're always there to save them. You're always there to save them. You're always there to save them. And then they learn, I'll always have you to depend on to save me. So it's okay if I mess up. No. And so I learned, let go. There's the God's issue. Some of them spread their wings and flew. Some of them are messed up right now. But it's God's to deal with, not mine. You know, like my brother is one of those people right now. And I've told him, you know, I won't help you the way you want help anymore. If you want help, I'm going to help you my way. And if my way is not for you, then my help's not for you. I love you and I'll pray for you and I'm here for you. But we're going to do it this way or no way. Because if we've, I've tried it your way. And I know it's never going to work. It was always, I just need money for a hotel, for drugs, for yada, yada, yada. I don't want to go to rehab. I don't want help. I don't want, then I can't help you. If you want help, we're going to do it this way. But here David is with this desire to take God out of, out of his tent and to elevate him into a permanent residence in the land. Verse 3, Nathan said to the king, go, do all that is in your mind. For Yahweh is with you. Now my version says mind. Some of your versions says heart. And there's a reason for that. And I feel like you, most of you probably know this. We've talked about it, but I'll say it again. Is in antiquity, the heart was considered the seat of thought. It is where the intellect took place. It's where you consider things here. And they considered the bowels or the gut the place of emotion. And we still use those phraseologies today. We'll say things like, I remember my mom when we were young. Sorry, I'm throwing you on the spot. But I remember her saying, I hate him with all my guts. I don't remember who she was talking about, but I remember hearing that. I was like, with your gut. <laughs> the one that we're all more familiar with is, I feel it in my gut. It's a gut feeling. Because the gut was the place of feeling and the heart was the place of thought. We've now come to understand that the mind is actually the place of thought. And the heart is just a beating muscle. And yes, there are neurons, it turns out, in the heart, but your heart can't think. You know, if you hook yourself, you hook yourself up to a blood machine that can act as your heart and remove your heart, your brain still functions the same. The brain really is the place of thought. The heart has neurons for its own purposes, but it can't think. If you shut off the brain, the heart can't think for you. You die. The brain really is that place. This is the holy of holies in our temple. Here is where the Spirit of God dwells. The heart. It's an important muscle, really important. You die without it. Actually, you can live without it. You can stick a pig's heart in you and live, technically, you know. They've done that. But that's the heart. Nathan tells David, do it. Do it. Look how he says it, though. 
Go, do all that is in your mind, for Yahweh is with you. Nathan acted in foolishness for that. What Nathan should have said is, let's ask God. Let me seek the Lord on your behalf. The foolishness of Nathan's statement isn't for David to build the temple. The foolishness is to assume because God is with you, your petition is from God. Never think that because you have the favor of God that what you decree and what you will is the will of God. That is a foolish and stupid mistake on our part. I've heard people say that God is with me. So is the devil. <laughs> you, know, like, <laughs> you don't think the devil's sitting on your shoulder too, whispering sweet nothings into your ear? Cool, God is with you. What does that have to do with this? If God is with you, then listen to him. We don't command God. We don't assume anything. I mean, there are things, if the word of God has established a fact, then sure, you don't need to pray about it. Here's one. Should I ever cheat on my wife? I was like, well, it took you guys a while to answer. The answer is no. Why don't I need to seek God out for that one? Because his word has already established the matter. Don't have to seek him on that. His word has established that. That is an established fact. We don't need an opinion on that. We don't need God's input. The answer is no unequivocally. Should I eat Bob's or Burger King? I feel like that's a stupid question too, but of course Bob's. But yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> but you know, my point is the Bible hasn't established that, and you know, some things you don't need God's opinion on. Sometimes God, just, should I move to Santa Fe? Should I stay in Albuquerque? Where should I plant your church, Lord? Well, His Word doesn't tell me where I should go. So what do you think I should do? I should probably seek him out on that one. And sometimes God will even put us in the place to say, you choose. Sometimes. And other times God says, go. You know where God told me to go? Santa Fe. I went. He told me to go. I know he did. He opened impossible doors that I asked him to open. God told me to go to Santa Fe. And then God told me to come back. And then I was super confused. And I now understand, looking back, I'm like, I get it now. Santa Fe was for a purpose. It was for them, and it was for me. And God has raised me up in different ways because of that. The things I learned up there, I needed. That I, I'd never got that here. So we seek God for His will. We don't assume because God is with us, everything we think is the will of God. That's foolish. Even if it looks like it's going to be beneficial to the Lord. But Nathan makes the foolish mistake. He says, do all that is in your heart. For Yahweh is with you. I like what I wrote here. I know I already said it, but I'll say it again. Just because God is with you doesn't mean you're incapable of making stupid decisions. <laughs> Verse 4 through 7. But in the same night, the word of Yahweh came to Nathan saying, Go, say to my servant David, thus says Yahweh. Are you the one that should build me a house to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the day I brought up the sons of Israel from Egypt, even to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent, even in a tabernacle. Whenever I have gone with all the sons of Israel, did I speak a word with one of the tribes of Israel, which I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? So God is listening. God obviously intercepts the conversation because he's there. And I'd imagine the idea was probably like, really? Really, Nathan? Was this at my command or decree? Did I ask for this? Have I at any point? Actually, as a matter of fact, there's a, t a ton of sarcasm in this. If you can't hear it, it's there. The point is, I didn't ask for this. I don't know where you get off speaking on my behalf like that I, w I didn't ask for this Nathan who gave you permission to tell David go and do as you have thought in your heart we should be very leery with or without God hearing what's in our heart because Jeremiah 79 tells us 
the heart is exceedingly wicked above all else. Your heart lies to you. The heart is a liar. The heart will tell you things that sound really good and sometimes even scriptural. And they're not. That is why we rely on the word of God, not on the heart. How can a man keep his way pure? Not by keeping it according to his heart, by keeping it according to God's word. That's how. God looks at Nathan and says, I haven't asked this. You're going to build me a house? This is what I was supposed to tell you about Riley and the whole bed, but I did it in the beginning. But it's that same concept. God didn't ask for this to be done. And the greatest way you and I can serve the Lord is with our obedience. Don't assume anything for God. He doesn't need your assumption. God doesn't need your opinion. God doesn't even need your input. God needs you to be still. He needs you to be listening and ready to act in obedience when he says to go. Does that mean you can't talk to God? I mean, talk to him, of course. Converse. Just be careful feeling like you're on some high moral ground when you talk to him. You know how it is when we talk to other believers, right? We got to make sure it's known that, hey, I know my stuff. I got a foot in here. We don't have a foot in with the Lord. Our job is to be still and to listen. We are in a place right now of listening. You know, as I was going through this text, my heart was so heavy because <laughs> I... For the last six months, maybe more, I feel like God has waited on my heart to the greatest degrees to find a bigger building. And for a moment there, it looked like we were going to get it. We have that smoke shop down the way here is like 4,000 square feet. And I was like, looked like it was going to happen. And then it didn't. I mean, God provided us with all kinds of stuff. Like we got 200 chairs just waiting to go. We got this massive soundboard that we were blessed with. And we have all of these intricacies for the workings of a bigger building whenever God opens that door. But I got so distracted with the thought of getting a bigger space. It looks empty now, but sometimes it's like so full, it's like we're choking because a little space like this, again, I'll, I'll say it like this. We've had as much as like 50 people in here and 30 kids in the back. Yep. Is that a little room there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, they would, it would work. They would do it. And like, you know, and then they come out here and you got 80 people in this little room and it's like, whoa, like I get scared. I'm like, oh man, what are we going to do? It's not my problem, it's God's problem. But when it looked like that was a possible reality, I got so caught up in the idea that I lost sight of being still. And that may be very well why, why God shut it off. I wasn't ready. We want to be so careful speaking on behalf of God. And again, for me, I was like, well, of course God's going to do it. Look what he blessed us with. Look what he's doing. Look what's going on. It's going to happen. I learned whatever God wants to do, cool. Again, it's happened, you know, we're, uh, Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights. Even some of the Sunday nights have been like really full. And I'm like, eh, it's God's. It's not my problem. It's his. If we run out of seats, there's some floor to sit on, you know. I'm, we can house what's here and that's about it and until God does something else this is what it is but I, I, can't, I can't let myself get distracted and say well because the people are coming that means God wants us to do this or that so what I've learned to do is Shh, Lord what do you want me to do Lord I, I'm going to be faithful with what I have with what you put in my possession we're going to be faithful with this building we're going to be faithful with this space with these chairs with this coffee equipment we're going to serve your people we're going to love them we're going to lift your name high we're going to worship and praise you and serve you and if you open the doors for another spot we will walk through those doors and if you don't lord then this is right where we're supposed to be please lord help me not to be distracted that's the attitude it's the attitude david should have had that's the attitude god is impressing on nathan did i ask for that did I say to do this or that? Have I spoken to any one of my people? The answer is no. Verses 8 and 9, he says, Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name like the names of the great men who are on the earth. 
God reminds David that he's the one who's in control. Verse 8, he looks at David's past. In verse 9, he looks at David's present. He says, I took you from the pastures, David. I'm the one that plucked you up as a shepherd of sheep to be a shepherd of my people. I love that because God is essentially telling David, I chose you. You didn't choose me. And then he goes on to say, I have been with you. I have delivered you from your enemies and I will make your name great. There's an emphasis in those two verses. And the emphasis is on God. I, I've done this. I'm in control. I'm the one leading. I'm the one directing. I'm the one calling. You're the recipient here, David. In verse 10 and 11, he says, I will also appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them that they may live in their own place and not be disturbed again. Nor will the wicked afflict them any more as formerly, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Yahweh also declared to you that Yahweh will make a house for you. He says, I will appoint a place for my people. I will bring a place of permanence. Your job, David, is to be still. Your job is to listen. Your job is to obey. I will lead. I will direct. I will make happen. And when I open those doors, you walk. I've found that if we're busy trying to make God's will happen for our life, we'll be too busy and loud to hear him when he talks. I'm confident of that. And I believe many of us miss the voice of God because we're busy about our will instead of God's. Or we're busy trying to make God's will happen in our lives instead of actually listening to what God's will is for us. God speaks softly. He's not a husband who is aggressive. He's not a husband who is in your face and loud and obnoxious. He's tender. And his voice is soft. Stern, but soft. And if you're busy talking, if you're busy moving and doing things you shouldn't be doing, you're going to have an extraordinarily hard time hearing his voice. He says, I will appoint a place for my people, for their permanence. And then he ends verse 11 saying, I will make you a house, David. You desire to do this for me? No, no, no. You got it backwards, buddy. I'm going to make you a house. Now God's house is a more permanent house than the house David had in mind. David wanted to take him out of the tent and put him in a structure. God says, I'm going to build you a family, David. Now, I believe God says that for a really good reason. If we were to rewind to the last King Saul, what happened to Saul? Him and his descendants are dead. Not all of them. We're going to see most of them are going to die coming forward, but the, 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 the line to the throne is dead. Saul and his sons are, are, are dead. David has assumed the throne at the will and decree of God. Even the throne, David didn't take that. God gave it to him. And I'd imagine in David's heart, there's a quaking. What if I fail like Saul failed? It doesn't say he said or thought that, but you would have to imagine that thought would perpetuate in his own mind saying, God took it from him. What if he takes it from me? I better build God a house. I better tiptoe and be on my best. That may very well be what's in David's heart, which may be why God says this exact thing. I'll build you a house, David. And we're going to see here in a moment that house is his descendants. In essence, David, what I'm promising you isn't contingent on you. What I'm promising you, this is called an unconditional promise, meaning there's nothing you can do from to remove this promise from my hand. That I'm going to do this because of my namesake. It has nothing to do with you. Because ultimately what God wants to do is bring a certain person out of the line of David. You guys know what his name is? Jesus. Yeshua HaMashiach. Shiach. You know, it's not from up here. It's from down there. HaMashiach. No, it is. It's from the back, the back and the bottom of the throat. But anyways, that's, that's, that's who God is essentially looking forward to in the future. That's going to be the permanence of David's house. His Messiah, Mashiach. And he tells him, I'm going to make you a house, Dave. 
verse 12 through 15. When I find verse 12. <laughs> when your days are complete and you lie down with your fathers, I will rise up your descendant after you, who will come forth from you, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he will be a son to me. And when he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. And I believe right there, God is addressing the worry that's in David's heart. I won't do to you what happened to Saul. It was never about Saul. It was never going to be Saul. It was always about David. David just wasn't ready. Israel was in rebellion. So God said, you want a king? Here you go. Enjoy. Learn this lesson. And then the man that God, I believe, truly saw, rose up. And he says, I won't do that to you, David. Your kingdom is established. Your son, he's going to take the throne, and that's going to be a permanent throne. Now, if we go through the annals of history, was the throne permanent? Mm. Well, when the Babylonians came, they jacked, they jacked Israel up pretty bad. They took everything. They stripped that place. They wrecked it. They went away for 70 years. And then they came back and kind of tried to rebuild. And I mean, they did it, but it's like, eh. the glory that was there wasn't really there. The kingdom as was known, wasn't what it was. And I don't believe a king sat on the throne that day going forward and hasn't since. However, the throne being the line, ultimately that throne is Christ. And that's ultimately what the Lord is getting at, is your line will never deplete David, ever. It'll never come to an end. Primarily because Christ lives Christ is a descendant of David. Although he is God incarnate, he is also the son of David. And he lives for how long? His throne will never end. So again, when we look at it from the perspective of man, it's almost like this two-tone kind of like, but when we see it from the perspective of God, that throne is established forever. Today, where is the throne of David? David. I don't know, it's kind of gone. <laughs> but Jesus is coming back to set that throne up. The king is still there, which means there, there's technically a throne. The king has just got to come make a claim back to the land. And it's going to happen probably sooner than later. But that is the essence of what God is saying. I believe he is quieting David's trembling heart. The heart as his emotions toss to and fro. Through verse 12 and 15, he says that his son is going to build the house. Why not David? First Chronicles 22, 8 through 10, he says, you're a man of war and a man of bloodshed. He says, this isn't, this isn't yours, David. Your son, Shlomo, Solomon, peace, Mr. Peacemaker, he's going to be the one to do it. And we're going to see Solomon, huh? It's similar, yes. Yeah, it's a pretty, that's, that's the essence of it. And Solomon, he's going to come with his own set of issues. But Solomon is going to be the guy that God is going to use to erect the tabernacle, the, the temple, I should say. He says, I'm going to be a father to him, and my loving kindness will not depart from him. Verse 16 and 17, he says, Your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. And again, the essence is the bloodline will always be present. And it is. In accordance with all these words and all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. So David got a little gun-ho happy and probably a little bit inspired by fear, which again, we want to be careful acting out of fear to the Lord. Don't ever think that if I do for God, he'll somehow give me these brownie points. That's always the wrong reason. You know, I always tell people, we do what's right because it's right. No other reason. You do what's right because it's right and that's it. If you're not doing what's right because it's right, then you just shouldn't do it. If there's some ulterior motive, you're probably wrong in that motive. Although motives might appear pure, 
the road to hell is carved full of good intentions. You know, it's kind of like when you feed the homeless. Whenever I'm arguing with somebody and they're explaining to me how they're a good person and how they do good deeds and I do this and I do that. I'm like, dude, listen to you. You're full of pride. Like, what do you do what you do? Do you do it for the benefit of these people or do you do it for social status? Are you doing it to get a picture for Facebook, to get a pat on your back? I mean, if you feed the person, you know, so that you feel good about yourself, I'm glad you fed them. But your motive is still skewed. You didn't do it because it was right. You did it to feel good about yourself. If you can't see the wickedness in that statement, then you are a blind human being. And again, the point is that we are evil at nature. Like There's none good. Good things done with wrong motive are still bad. Although good may come from it, you get no real brownie points before the Father. We do what we do because we are Christians and because it's the right thing to do, not because we get anything out of it. That's why as Christians, we love and we serve people even when they hate us. You know, I've said this time and time again, and I stand by this. I serve every last one of you. I don't care what you give or if you give. If you give more, I don't serve you more. If you give less, I don't serve you less. I don't, that's between you and God. I serve every person that walks through these doors the same. Now, I might not like you all the same because our personalities might clash. And that's, that, that's just a reality. I'm still going to love you. Oh, there's some people that get on my nerves a little bit and more hairs up on top of your... I'm just kidding. No, you know, but, but by and far, I get along with most everybody. But sometimes some people come in and it's, they're really hard to handle, but I treat them the same. I'll give them the same benefit with coffee the same with snacks the same if they want to talk i will talk to them i will love on them but we're just not as buddy buddy and i'm a little bit closer to some other people and that's it's okay that's family vibes, family vibes. <laughs> it is but you know why do we do the things we do but you know david i believe is acting out of fear and god put that fear to rest he says there's nothing to fear david your line is settled and established. You're going nowhere, buddy. Verse 18, it says, Then David then David the king went in and sat before Yahweh and said, Who am I, O Yahweh God? I should say, Who am I, O Lord Yahweh, is actually what it says. And what is my house that you have brought me this far? David is afraid. David is seeking to please God with outward service. Nathan puts that to rest as God speaks through him. And so David responds in adoration and he comes to God and he praises him. And he says, who am I, God? He sits before him, who am I? That you would love me like this. I feel that when David says that, I think of that often, Lord, who am I that you use me? Like, who am I that, that, that I'm worthy to stand or sit before your people and share your word? Who am I that your spirit would speak a word through me, Lord? Who am I that I'm worthy to be able to do this? I'm not. It's because God is faithful. It's nothing to do with me. Like David, God chose me. I didn't choose this. God chose me. God has raised me up and God has put me here and he speaks. And if you guys listen, you'll hear him. Because this is his word. If you don't hear him, well, maybe I'm in the way or maybe your heart's a little whacked out, but God uses, God works, and he's moving. Now it says here that he sat before Yahweh. It's quite possibly that literal that he sat before God because they have brought, they have brought in the ark from Kiryat Yerim and the ark is now with David in the city. And so it's very likely that David comes before the ark and bows down, he sits down, whatever it is he does and pours out his heart to the Lord. And again, he says, Who am I, O Lord Yahweh? What is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was insignificant in your eyes, O, o Lord Yahweh. For you have spoken also of the house of your servant concerning the distant future. And this is the custom of man, O Lord Yahweh. David receives this beautiful word from God. A gift, really. The gift is, David, I will uphold your house always. And David's response is to magnify God. 
That should be the response when God speaks a word into us. That should be the response when God uses us. That should be the response when God moves. There is the temptation to want to be filled with pride. David could have went the other direction and said, Look how great I am, Lord. Oh, God chose me over you bunch of little peasants. David is dismayed though. He's, he can't believe it. Who am I, Lord? I'm nobody. You make me a somebody though, Lord. Humility is one of the key attributes of a person truly following after the Lord. It really is. And again, I'm here to tell you the temptation is so real to want to take that glory for ourselves when God uses us. When God does something, when God promises something, when God creates wealth in a family, it's easy for us to say, I did this. I made these moves. I get up and go to work. I'm the one that runs the, 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 the payroll. I'm the one that invested. I'm, and you hear all those eyes? That's pride. Rather than, you know, God has really done a great work here. God opened these doors and man, look what he did. Look how much God is working. Look how, look how God is doing. Look, do you hear the difference? One magnifies me, the other magnifies him. David has the right response and the right attitude. He magnifies God and he blesses his name and he, he blesses him for that gift. He doesn't take it on his own. But then he says something really interesting in verse 19. And this one really caught me. In verse 19 he says, This was insignificant in your eyes, O Lord Yahweh, for you have spoken also of the house of your servant concerning the distant future. And this is it right here. And this is the custom of man, O Lord Yahweh. When it says this is the custom of man, it literally says in the Hebrew, this is the law of man. In Hebrew, it's literally written out like this. Ozat Torah Hadam Adonai Yahweh. Torah Hadam, the law of Adam, is literally what the Hebrew says. And I wonder, I'm not saying it is. I read, I, I spent a lot of time right here trying to figure out what this means. Because whenever I'm studying, I, I really want to bring you guys food. And this chapter was really hard. You know, especially when I got there because nobody had anything productive to say. The things that I were seeing, they weren't making a whole lot. You know when somebody wants to sound smart, so they say stuff to that way it just doesn't look like they don't know what they're talking about. But if you really go back and look and listen to what they were saying, it's like that has nothing to do with what this is saying. And I, I came across a lot of that. Nothing that people were saying made sense. And most people stayed silent on the matter. So I, I pulled up some of Skip's videos. What does Skip say? Nothing. What does who say? No, I can't. Nothing. And it's bothering me. And I'm like, and when I get like that, I get all antsy. I can't move past the verse till I understand it. To, to some degree. But I find it interesting. Torah ha Adam. The law of Adam. Torah Adam. And I wonder if in David's mind, he's thinking back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The proto evangelium. If you're with us on Wednesday nights, like a year and a half ago, two years ago. We were in Genesis. And the third weekend, we got to Genesis 3. And in 3.15, God is standing before the devil, before Adam and before Eve, because the fall has just happened. They rebelled against God. And he looks to the serpent and he tells the serpent, her seed will crush your head. When God mentions her seed, that's called proto-evangelium. Proto means first, Evangelia means a mention of good, the good news. The, the first mention of good news. That was the first time Christ was implied in the scriptures to come. That's what that means. Because women don't have seeds. Women have eggs. Men have seeds. The seed of the man is implanted into the egg of the women. And that's what brings forth a child. God bypasses that and says, Her seed is going to stomp your head. Talking to the serpent which means God is going to do something miraculous. We call that the virgin birth, the mention of Christ coming. And I wonder if David looks back at that and says, the law of Adam, so to speak, because God's word is the law. What God promised Adam, is, is this what you're talking about, Lord? I don't know, but in the Hebrew, Torah ha-adam, 
the Torah of Adam, the law of Adam. It's literally what it's saying. Or you can say the law of man, because Adam means man. If it's just the law of man, it makes no sense. I, I, I tried. I, 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 I tried. I looked up words. I read books. I listened to teachings. Nothing. But if he's mentioning the law of Adam, and he's, it's concerning the distant future, is what he just said, and the establishment of his kingdom forever... David must understand that this line is the messianic line and this is the line you spoke of to Adam and Eve in the garden Adam being the head of the house this has got to be it Lord I don't know tuck that in your minds do with it what you will I don't know but I'm going to stand I believe that's what he's talking about otherwise it does not make sense I can't make sense of it for you without that but verse 20 again what more can David say to you for you know your servant O Yahweh God I love that. We always talk about this. It's not about you knowing the Lord. It's about the Lord knowing you. If God doesn't know you, that's the real issue at hand. Jesus at the day of judgment is not going to say, you didn't know me. His words are going to be, I don't know you. We want to make sure that God knows us. David says, Lord, you know me. You know me. What, what can I say? What can I do? Verse 21 for the sake of your own word and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness. Let your servant know. He says, you are great, God, and I acknowledge your greatness. There is none like you. He moves from his personal experience to his historical evidence. Verse 21, he uses that personal experience. And then 22, the historical evidence it says, For this reason you are great, O Yahweh God. There is none like you, and there is no God beside you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. We have your word, Lord. We are the keepers of your law. These are what you've promised from long ago. Lord, I can tell in 21, because of what you've done for me, your loving kindness, your greatness, and not just in my personal experience, what you've promised through the historical do documented data. Lord, we can stand on what you're saying is essentially what David is saying. Verse 23 and 24. And what one nation on earth is like your people Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people and to make a name for himself and to do a great thing for you and an awesome thing or awesome things for your land before your people whom you have redeemed for yourself from Egypt, for nations and their gods. For you have established for yourself your people Israel as your own people forever. And you, O Yahweh, have become their God. He says, your people are uniquely yours. You redeemed them from Egypt and you have established them as your people. Again, he's just looking again. The history, Lord, my personal experience, historically speaking, I stand on what you're saying. I know this to be true and we can rely on that. And I think... That's a really important principle for you and I. There's two things you can stand on for the validity of God's word. Your personal experience and what he's done in the past. I've said this before and I'll say it again. For me, this is a pivotal moment in my Christian walk. Again, when we talk about Ebenezer stones, that's essentially what David's doing. He's looking back to the past on moments where God has been faithful. When I was, I would say, I, was, I wasn't new to the faith, but I, I wasn't old. I was couple of years in, four or five years into the faith, I'd say, maybe a little less. But I was really strong in my walk at that moment. And I was going to the church on the east side. And I remember I was on I-40 coming home, and it was evening already. It was dark. And I remember I was just about, I passed Rio Grande River coming west, and I was about to pass under the I-40, um, the, the little I is what they call it, the course exit. And I remember I had this thought cross my mind that put me in a panic. And the thought was, what if this is all fake? And I panicked. And I was like, what if this is all fake? And like, I, I, I literally freaked out in my car doing like 65, 75 hour fast. I was going, I started freaking out. Like, what if this is fake? And I remember God saying, remember when I changed you and transformed your heart? Remember when I did this and I did that? And God started reminding me of all of these things he had done. And all of a sudden, I had peace. And I was like, I know it's real and I know you're true because of my personal experience and because of what you've done in the past. <sighs> I freaked out though because, you know, I'd like to tell you as a pastor, I don't have moments of 
doubt or panic. I do. I do. The enemy creeps in on me just like he does you. And I'm still responsible for having a relationship with God just like you. And I don't get some special pass. If anything, I get hit harder than most of you. And it requires me to be as much or more faithful in my study and my reading and in my prayer. And if I'm not, I get hit significantly harder because if I fall, people fall with me to a greater degree. And I become a public stain on the name of Christ. And then like was said to David, and we'll see that later, it becomes a mockery to the heathens and they get to look at God and mock him for the failure of one of his servants who is, so, so to speak, lifted up, so to speak. Not that I'm lifted up, but you get what I'm saying. Our personal experience and what God's done in the past those are important pieces going forward as encouragement, establish, establishing us knowing that what God has done, what God is doing and going to do is set in stone and we are okay. You can, you can trail the future forward with surety is my point if I'm not making sense in that. Verse 25, David says, Now therefore, O Yahweh God, let me read that again. I messed up. Now therefore, O Yahweh God, the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and his house, concerning it forever, and you do as you have spoken. He said, Lord, make it happen. Who's it on to accomplish this? It's on the Lord. He says, Yahweh, you spoke it, you make it happen. That's the beauty here too. You know who's responsible for getting you to the end if you're really God's? It really is Him. You still have your responsibility in it too though. If you are born again, you can't be unborn again. You'll make it to the end and he'll see to that. How do you want to make it to the end? That's on you. <laughs> you know, how rich do you want that entrance to be and how, or how depleted and minimal do you want that entrance to be? Do you want to get into heaven by the skin of your teeth or do you want to come in guns blazing, so to speak? If you're born again, you are born again. I don't believe you can lose your salvation. I believe God is bigger than that. Again, I think of my son. You know how my son cannot be my son? He can't. He's, that's, he's my son. There's nothing you can do about that. And when you're born again, you're his. And if you understand in the New Testament when they talk about this term born again, adopted, if you understood how deep those roots are, you can't undo them. In the Greek culture, when you were adopted, it was a process that could never be undone and you were considered a higher status than an actual natural born son. Because they looked at it like this. The son was born from genetics, but the adopted child was chosen. So when we look at how deep when the Bible says you're adopted is, it can't be undone. But again, do you want to go into heaven full blessing at hand or just enough to squeeze in because God is faithful? You know, that's just between you and God. Verse 26, though, but it is on him. David makes, makes that stance here in verse 26, that your name may be magnified forever by saying, Yahweh of hosts is God over Israel. And may the house of your servant David be established before you. For you, O Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, have made a revelation to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. I'm going to finish it off. Now, O Yahweh God, you are God and your words are the truth and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Yahweh, O Lord Yahweh, have spoken and with your blessing, may the house of your servant be blessed forever. David takes what God has promised and he stands in it. And he stands in the strength of God's word and what he says and he blesses God and confirms his words. I'm going to, my phone, this one's going to die. Let me see, I got 7%. All right, I'm going to say this. God told David that David couldn't build the house. Again, I believe David's, his want to build the house was rooted out of fear. The fear that like Saul, his house would be removed. God says, Never. But he also tells David, not you, your son. Now David can do one of two things at this point. David could either say, close call. All right, let's reign and rule. He doesn't necessarily do that. If we were to read, you don't have to go there, I'm not even going to turn there. But if you were to go to First Chronicles chapter 29 and read verses 2 through 9, 
David does something particular. And it's really beautiful. David spends a good portion of his life accumulating wealth. And he sets certain amounts of that wealth aside. Gold, brass, silver, wood. I feel like once I remember reading, I was trying to find it last night and I couldn't, I didn't look too hard though. But I feel like he even made the plans. But all that to say, David made all the preparations for the building of the temple. So that when his son assumed the throne, it would be ready to build. And David worshipped God in that manner. Although David wasn't able to build it, David made sure that everything that was going to be needed was at hand. And I think that's beautiful. I think that's a beautiful picture of serving God while we wait. Sometimes there's things you want to do for God and the answer is no. Some of you want to get married. You know what the best thing you could do right now is? Serve the Lord while you wait. Don't just wait. Serve God while you wait. Be about His business. I know I'm like, there's this idea, because I used to think the same way, when God brings me my wife, then we'll get crazy and serve and do all this and that. And the truth is, if you ain't serving God now, you're not going to serve Him then. You're going to be too busy, at least in your own mind. Serve Him now. And what's cool is God just may bring you someone who serves alongside of you. And then you get married, and then you can serve together. When you get married, your service will change. It'll be different. But you'll serve together because it's an attitude of the heart. David spends the, a good portion of his life to the end accumulating the necessities for the temple structure. And I love that. Father, we thank you for being God. And we thank you for your faithfulness and ask that you would uh, go before us in this coming week. Lord, help us to be grateful for what you have done in our lives, for what you are doing. We ask, Father, that you'd be glorified in our thoughts, in our actions, in our words, in our attitudes. We bless your holy name, Lord, and we just ask that your uh, will would be done in our lives. Thank you for these beautiful people here and online. and Just bless them, Dad. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.